Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay so um, welcome to this uh, course which is an introduction to turbulence um, we shall start with a brief introduction right for a couple of classes maybe and then move on to the um, questions like what exactly is turbulence and um, then see right okay so um, starting with fluid as a continuum I think that is what we will start with ok. So, uh, what I am say uh, what I am um, looking at is essentially ok. So, fluid okay. as a That is how you spell it right. I think you are aware of um, you know this um, word probably ok. You, you probably are aware of this. Um, uh, so, essentially let us discuss this for a little while you know as an introduction. So, I am talking about fluid as a uh, continuum. So, I am going to just sort of jot down a few things right in the beginning. Hmm? So, um, some very basic fluid concepts is basic equations and what you mean even by a fluid, how is that different from uh, a solid is something that you should look up. Uh, I think it will be useful uh, to sort of understand a lot of material which is which will be a part of this course ok. All that should be available uh, online. So, fluid as a continuum. So, what what are we talking about here? So, fluid is essentially an aggregation of molecules right. A fluid consists of several molecules. So, then you know what a liquid is and you know what a gas is both are fluids right. So, two examples of, of uh, fluid basically what I am talking about here is a liquid right and a gas right. Now, uh, and both of these, so fluid is made up of several molecules like I just said. So, both liquids and gases are made up of molecules, but then what is the difference? Uh, what makes one fluid a liquid and what makes another fluid a gas right. It is easy uh, to think right, uh, from those lines because the distance between molecules is very large compared to the molecular dia. Molecules are in a constant state of uh, uh, motion which where would that uh, fit in that description that would probably fit in for a gas is not it. So, the, the fluid particles are let us stick to molecules. So, the molecules are more closely packed ok uh, for a liquid. So, let us write that down here ok. Here molecules we are talking about molecules closely packed right. Now, for a gas however, the molecular distance is very large compared to the molecular dia. So, here the distance between molecules is quite large compared to the dia of the molecules. Right. Now, uh, molecules are of course, always in constant motion they are all in random constant motion. So, then uh, when we talk about uh, the distance, uh, distance between molecules. Uh, so, is that constant or is, is it changing because the, the molecules itself are moving right. So, I think when we mention distance is something like mean free path is something that uh, you know of. So, we will come to that a little later on ok. So, that is so, that is what it is. So, you have a liquid and you have a gas both which are fluids and both of which are made of uh, you know molecules, but um, 
th the way the molecules are uh, distributed is different because they are closely packed in a liquid and uh, in a gas they are more uh, far apart, they are more spread out. Okay. Specifically, distance between the molecules is much larger than the dia of the molecules. Right. So, given a volume, the number of molecules in it are yeah, that, that, that given a volume, the number of molecules in it are continually changing. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we understand by them. So um, now, in this scenario, just think about this. If this is the scenario, okay, especially for a gas, then how do we define any physical property? If you had to define, say, the property of, uh, say, density, for example, right? Now, how would you uh, define that? You know, distance is not same. The number of molecules at a given point of time is not same. Then, uh, how do we define that, right? How do we define uh, the density uh, of of any material, of any you know, fluid? How do we do that, right? So that's the question uh, which comes in, and therefore this concept of, you know, we come to this concept of uh, continuum, right? So, given a volume, given any volume of a fluid the number of molecules in it are constantly changing. So, let me write that there. Um, given a volume of a fluid, number of molecules are constantly changing right might as well also write here that molecules molecules are always in random motion anyways mm. okay okay what I have here are in random motion. Okay. So, molecules are in random motion and given a fluid number of molecules are constantly changing. That is a scenario. Um, right. So, then we definitely have to choose a volume, you know, we definitely want to choose a volume, you know, is that, is that even possible? Can we choose a volume where at least you know as the aggregate number of you know overall the number of molecules is not changing is constant okay and is that even you know you know possible is that even possible given a large say you know this classroom the classroom you know in in, in in a room wherever you are sitting right so can i define the density as one property over that entire room can i say one value of the density and that is the density at every point in the room is that possible Right, and if that is not possible, right, then can we define maybe a smaller volume, you know, where that is possible, where I can do that, right? But I need to do that because I definitely cannot, uh, you know, deal with a, you know, volume where the number of molecules is constantly changing. So I can't do that. So we need to choose. So what we need to do is we will choose. Let's just say we choose. And what do we choose? We choose a volume where the number of molecules in is nearly constant in spite of you know we are basically, basically choosing a volume in a given domain of fluid. So, let us just say this is a, you know this is a large volume of fluid okay. this is a huge volume of fluid right it should be it should be having no boundaries anywhere right. Just think of the you know atmosphere or something. Okay. So, then here I cannot define one particular value of density. So, then what I do is I choose you know maybe a volume something like this. Okay. I choose it choose this set of a volume where of course, there is interchange of molecules molecules are they are all in random motion. So, they come in come into this you know ma region marked red this is my uh, volume that I am thinking volume of say uh, this is volume V right. And there is constant interchange of molecules in and out of this volume V, but nearly 
they, but that it, the, the number of molecules inside the volume is nearly constant, right. So, although there is interchange of molecules, right. So, across you know the volume here, the uh, number of molecules is nearly constant. So, here the number of molecules is nearly constant, right. So, that is what I, uh, so this is a sort of um, volume that I am defining, ok. Let us talk a little more about this uh, volume, ok. Um, now, if this volume, now, now the thing is I need to get a physical feel for how big or how small this volume can be, right. Now, this volume if it is sufficiently large, right, then there is uh, a chance that this is possible, the number of molecules is nearly constant, right. So, let me give you an example of that, ok. Let me give you an example of that. For example, um, let us go to a new page, ok. Now, for example, if I have a volume which is like this, this, this is my large volume, right. And this are, these are all the molecules, right. These are all moving around, these are all moving around, ok. Random motions, there is molecular motions, ok. Something like that, something like that. Say, these are all molecules in a gas, so on and so forth, etcetera, etcetera, etcetera. Okay, right. Now, what sort of uh, size of a volume should I choose? What sort of a volume should I choose? Now, I could choose a volume like this much, just say like that, you know. The number of molecules in this volume is going to change, okay, because there is these molecules that you see here are all moving around, okay. And um, they are moving around and they are going in and out of this boundary that I have said, you know. So, let us call this as A. Okay. So, this is a little volume that I have. I could have another volume which is something like this, right. So, let us call that as B, right. So, now this is another volume and um, the number of molecules, so for example, A has just 1 in there and uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, about 7 molecules then it B, right. That is going to change because this is constant, constant interchange of these molecules, they are constantly moving around that is going to change, right. So, which one should I choose? Which one should I choose A or B or for example, maybe I could have a domain something like this, maybe something like this, something like this, right. So, this could be a domain as well C, right. Now, so the idea is, right, is the, vo if the if this volume is large enough, right, if it is large enough, then this the number of uh, molecules in it at a particular time is not going to be negligible, right. You are covering more space. So, so basically it is not going to be where you know negligible, right. And you there is sufficient molecules in there, so that yeah, so you, you, you can define a physical property you know, uh, which kind of represents the entire domain. We will get to that a little in a little bit, ok. Now, I could take again and let me draw one more, ok. And I could also have a volume th like this, you know, or for example, this much. Let us look at this D. E does does not seem to have anything, you know, uh, not a single molecule right there, but then it will change in another instance of time it will immediately change because there will be some molecules crossing the boundaries and getting in or getting out, right. If I have a bound, if I have a domain, if I have a volume which is so small with you know D, right, which is really really small, then what, what do you what do you suspect? Here basically it can contain probably a single molecule maybe two molecules at the most, right. I am making it that small, this is my choice. So, I am making it that small. So, in this case, if it is that small, right, the mole molecular, 
you know, the behavior, each molecule's behavior or um, the variations is not going to be in sync. Th that's going to be dominant. That's going to be dominant, right? So, for example, so what I'm trying to say here is that, for example, for this volume, say D, right? It is small enough. It is very small. Okay, it is very small, right? Such that, what do you, what do I mean by here? That molecular variations are significant. Okay. So, how each molecule behaves, the each mo um, uh, molecules uh, variations, you know, uh, is going to be significant for uh, say a volume like D. But if you take a volume like C, if you take a volume like C, then what happens? If I take a volume like C, it has sufficient number of molecules such that I can take their property as a whole. I can take all of their properties as a whole right, and define it as an average right, for this entire volume. And therefore, I could probably have a density value which is a single value and which you can use over the entire domain of C. Right? For example, if I gave you a glass of water, what would be the density of water there? You immediately say 1000 kg per meter cube. Why would you say that? Right? So, that, that is a kind of domain, that is the kind of definition that we are looking for. So, in this is the concept, this is essentially the uh, concept of um, uh, continuum that I am getting at. Okay? So, volume C essentially has sufficient Um, number of molecules, right? And this number, this number, say, you know, just to give you, the, I mean, to make it, you know, give a crude example. So, it has, say, at an instant of time, it has, say, 100 molecules. So, the next instant is had, say, maybe 98, 99, but you know, it is sufficient, this number is sufficient to define an average, right, value of any physical property, which represents the entire fluid, right. So, I am talking about a fluid density. So, that density, each molecule may behave differently, right, but I am looking at a macro property here, okay. But then, that macro property, if I take the entire volume, if I define one density for the entire atmosphere covering the entire earth that is not going to be very representative. So, I am going to try and cut it down where that will make sense. So, I am looking at a volume, you know, which is, you know, something like C, where the number of molecules is constant at, uh, you know, uh, over a period of time. It is more or less constant, okay. And please note that when I say uh, the number of molecules of constant, molecules are constantly moving across this boundary. Right? This boundary is uh, not physical. It, it's 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 our concept of how we define, you know, uh, you know, physical properties for a given fluid. So the molecules uh, are actually moving across this boundary at a very random pace and constantly. However, I've taken a volume which is sufficiently large enough such that the number of molecules which remain inside at a given particular instant of time is constant. Right. As a result of which, I can define, say, a property like uh, density, velocity, etcetera, as a single value, as an average value of all these molecules inside uh, here, okay, and that will represent the fluid. Okay. Okay. So um, fine. Now, let, let, let me sort of uh, write this down then. Okay. So, let us just say, um, if I were to put it in like an equation form. Okay. So, let the given volume, okay, let the given volume is this. Okay. 
molecular mass. Okay. Then how do I define density? Molecular mass is uh, delta m like the mass of all the molecules inside the volume delta v. Right. So, then that is basically equal to mass by volume, right. But, um, there is, a, is there anything else that I should write here? This is the volume that I want to define, right. This is the volume I want to define. How big or how large can this be? So, let us just say this happens over a limit where right and this delta v star. So, this uh, the volume tends to a um, you know specific particular uh, volume right and this I am giving you some values actually right for all fluids ok. For all fluids at atmospheric pressure right. Um, this volume, so this volume at standard temperature pressure ok, it contains molecules right and this is sufficient to define a constant gamma right. This is uh, sorry constant density any physical property actually this is sufficient define a constant rho I mean ok. So, that is my density. So, that is what I uh, mean right. So, you, you can see that I have always wondered what is this continuum ok. It has this uh, similarity with the world uh, with the with the word continuous, but it is not continuous right. So, in this context, so this is something which is I am um, talking about this in terms of you know being continuous or is it a continuum ok. Now, if you see here if you look at this you know the domain C that with the volume C that I just uh, spoke about you know the molecules are not equally spaced, the molecules are not equally distributed right. They are not obviously you know they are in random motion and the only thing is the number of molecules right are uh, defined are defined um, uh, uh, the number of molecules which are in C are nearly constant ok. And this is the and I gave you a little example these are standard values. So, um, this this volume where the number of molecules is constant. So, that how many molecules the molecules is 3 into 10 to the power 7 ok. And uh, what is the volume? The volume is 10 to the power minus 9 cube of a millimeter. Okay. So, that is the volume and that is the co corresponding number of molecules and if I have a volume like that right, then uh, it is, this is sufficient to define a constant physical property in this case I am talking about a density which is this right. Now, so this is basically a molecular view. So, what I have shown you here in this uh, diagram here the, uh, the volume C. So, I have all these molecules spread out and um, that is it right these are all the molecules which are spread out. And what is the continuum? Now, the moment I define the moment I define a constant gamma right. Now, if I were to look at a molecule if I if I want if I want to look look at this as a molecular view right. This molecule this molecule etcetera it is going to be different right. But now I have I have said that I am going to define a volume which uh, I am going to define a domain which has a certain volume which has a nearly constant uh, number of molecules you know in a given instant of time. And using that I am defining a constant physical property. When I say a constant 
what did this constant mean? What does this constant mean? This constant gamma means what? Yes, over time, yes. Con gamma. So, one is it does this change over uh, ga over time? Well, the number of molecules is changing over time, isn't it? Right? Because they are in random motion. But that's what we said that all although you know there is molecular exchange, you know, uh, across the boundaries over but over this domain it is nearly constant. Right. So, when I say constant gamma, I basically mean that for this entire domain C, it is a constant value. Okay. This density is constant, which means, which means that I think now that I have defined one value of this density, that density is applicable is the same anywhere in this domain, anywhere in this domain. Right. So, I can therefore, you know, divide this, uh, you know, domain into smaller parts in a very much smaller parts, right. But each of those parts will still have a density rho, because that is the density that I am talking about, right. So, that so that makes this domain when, when I look at this now, when I look at this space, I might as well just you know change the, uh, okay, let me go to another page. Okay. So, uh, let me just sort of uh, redraw that, okay. So, uh, I have um, yeah, I have this domain, right. I have the same domain actually, let me try and sort of redraw that a little bit. Okay, it is the same domain, it is the same C I think we wrote like that, right. So, okay. So, we have all these molecules which are sort of spread around, okay, which are just distributed. Okay. So, this is nothing but the, this is the molecular view, right. What is the continuum view? The continuum view, continuum view is that this is basically, right. So, now you can chop this up into smaller parts, you can chop this up into smaller, uh, you know, uh, volumes, right. So, you could have that. So, this is the continuum view. Right. So, basically continuum view is where we disregard the individual molecular uh, properties or variations, right. And why are we able to do that? Because we take a, again I am kind of repeating myself. So, why am I able to do that? because I have taken a volume which is sufficiently large enough, well where the bulk aggregation of the molecules is not going to be insignificant and the number of molecules is going to be nearly constant. So, I am able to define a physical property like right, velocity, uh, density, uh, etcetera, etcetera, viscosity, right, in such a way that here the molecular variations or properties is not good is going to be insignificant, but the group the, the behavior of the group of molecules together in this volume that is going to be dominant. And when I take uh, the base, so because when I consider the density, how do I consider the density? I do consider you know the total mass of the molecules by in the total volume, I do consider that right. And that since the volume is constant and the number of molecules is constant. So, therefore, the density is also constant. Having said that, so when I do that, so I take uh, the mass, uh, the macro property like that and then I can apply the physical property on any small domain I choose to make here, right. I could make any uh, domains which is uh, smaller inside, you know. I could do that, I could do that, I could do this, etcetera, etcetera. I could do whatever I want. I could do that. And that is where the concept also comes, okay. That is where the also, so this is the continuum view, okay. And so that is where the constant, uh, the, uh, and these are, you know, in the molecular view, the small circles that I have drawn are basically molecules. So these are, okay, let me write that down. So these are basically molecules, okay. 
Now, what are these small little boxes that I have drawn here or some, some sort of little domains that I have drawn here. Right? So, this is where I am talking about a particle or infinitesimal element. Okay? You have you've heard these words, right? So, this is something which is a particle particle yeah, or you can also call it infinitesimal Um, element, yeah. Right? We say that all the time, but we is an infinitesimal element or a particle the same as a molecule? No, we are not saying that. Why we are not saying that? Because when I say a particle or an infinitesimal element, it will have the same density that you know is defined for this whole C. Then the density or the velocity, the viscosity is not going to change. Right? However, if I go down to a view where I am looking at each and every particle, each and every molecule, then it is different. So, basically I am looking, you know, we are getting into quantum physics at some point of time. Okay? So, we are not get going there. So, we are looking at uh, things from a continuum point of view. Right? Now, this becomes important for a class in uh, turbulence to understand, because uh, in turbulence uh, you will see that uh, it depends on how you look at the turbulence. If you look at it, you know, if you look more um, closely, so to speak, you know, this also happens when you are zooming in, right. When you zoom in, then you see more detail, right. I guess what I am trying to say in a continuum view is that we do not want so much detail as is going to be presented by individual properties and variations of molecules, right. However, if we can you know remove uh, we, we, if you can ignore that much many uh, you know that much of detail we can however look at macro properties uh, which give a fair bit of knowledge and a correct bit of knowledge about the physical processes that you know that we are really trying to understand here okay okay so let me give you a little more uh, information what we will do you know one, once we do this you know now we are talking about molecules, let us think about this. Okay. We think we are talking about molecules. So, molecules are in random motion, right. Then how do you define if that is how if that is the case, right. Uh, then how do you how do you envisage for example, the flow over the wing of an airplane? How do you envisage the flow moving through a pipe? Right, which comes, which is, uh, which is basically coming into your house, and you open your taps, and water flows out through it. Right? How do you define that? You define how do you define its movement? When you say velocity, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the velocity of each molecule? Is that what you're looking at? So that is where the continuum view is. What I, uh, you know, continuum concept of fluid as a continuum is what I am trying uh, this, is, this is this is what i'm um, you know trying to introduce here okay all right again let me give you some uh, some more you know values maybe okay so i think we're going to talk about something called um, you know a nutzen number okay so uh, to do that okay let us see let me give you some uh, values here right so now we are trying to understand a concept. So, we have to put some math into it, because we have, because we are in the business of calculating things, is not it, and manufacturing things and building things. So, we have to put some math into it, right. Okay. So, this is um, uh, again, these are some conditions, these are some uh, information. So, which I will give you. So, air at atmospheric conditions. So, what I am talking about is air at atmospheric conditions. Okay. Okay. So, here average spacing between molecules is 
that okay and then you have the mean free path which i was talking about a little bit earlier right so the mean free path right which is usually denoted as lambda okay that is equal to 6 into 10 to the power minus 8 meters okay so mean time between successive collisions mean time between successive okay collisions of the molecules right of the molecules is seconds Okay. So, because now the question also arises that you know uh, I did speak about uh, you know like what is the you know smallest geometric length scale that you could go to you know where you know this is not going to be violated. So, because where still where still you can define you know a constant value of gamma. So, you will you will be like because if I may just uh, go back a little bit just a moment. So, the question to ask would be that um, you know uh, now we had defined I am looking at C ok. Now, I am looking at C here. So, C was a domain where ok you know number of molecules is constant ok. Now, I and I am saying that um, I have uh, you know uh, defined a value of a physical property and I say that I can divide it down you know again into particle into particles or infinitesimal element. But here the question will again remain ok that how small can you get you know because if this gets smaller than you know is small enough to be just about the size of a molecule then your assumption is going to be wrong you know it is not going it is then it will not have the, you know the density the the average density value that you are talking about here. So, therefore, geometrically I still have to define the smallest value of this volume that I can get to right. So, therefore, what this is what therefore the small what is the smallest geometric length scale that we can we can actually uh, endure right. So, that is what we are talking about here. So, therefore, here this is for a now uh, these these are the properties of air ok and ok let us just write here ok this is for a general flow ok the smallest geometric length scale right. So, that should be greater than 10 to the power minus 4 uh, meters right ok. Now, if you if you look at this right now if the flow velocity for example, so this is the length scale we are talking about. The, so, that length scale is 10 to the power minus 4 ok. So, um, so which means that if the you know for example, if the flow velocity is say 100 uh, you know meters per second right, what should be the time scale for that that sort of a flow which should be basically 10 to the minus 6 seconds right time a uh, time scale of velocity. So, you uh, define by that ok. Ok, so now um, you can see how large or small uh, this is right. So, we use therefore, uh, the Knudsen number right for the separation of length scales. Length scales become very important in a turbulent flow understanding, because um, you will see slowly that there are behavior in the turbulent flow, which is not going to be very dominant when the length scale is of a certain size that sort of a behavior is happening only at a very small length scale 
the, when you say the whole flow is turbulent, that does not mean that there is interchange of energy at everywhere. Interchange of energy is happening, but in a certain pocket, in a certain smaller length scale. So, that is why uh, talking about this becomes important and that is why uh, I am trying to start with this. Okay. So, uh, Knudsen number again is used for separation of uh, scales. So, okay. the Knudsen number okay. used for separation of length scales. Okay. And what is that? So, this is nothing but makes sense I think right. So, this is the mean free path right. This is the mean free path which is basically um, the path which is traveled by a molecule between successive collisions. I think I am trying to remember I am if I am wrong to correct me. Okay. So, this is a mean free path. Okay. So, basically the molecules one is going to collide and then they are going to go and collide with somebody else. Right. So, it collides then it, it travels certain distance goes and hits somebody else. So, it, that is the mean free path free right. So, it is it's a, it's a mean path which is free it, it, when it is traveling from hitting one molecule to another. So, it is free at that time. So, the, you take all the values of all of that and take a mean of that that is the mean free path. Okay. So, mean free path is the lambda right and L is the smallest geometric length scale that I can get at which is this. So, in this case um, uh, you know for the general flow that we if you have said smallest length scale that we are looking at 10 to the power minus 4 meters. So, if th this is the case for this particular case then uh, here I can say the Knudsen number for this particular case right the Knudsen number is basically equal to um, 6 into 10 to the power minus 8 by 10 to the power minus 4 right and this is equal to 0 0.6 10 to the power minus 3 right. So, which is essentially what does this mean? This is this essentially means that the length scales is 3 times uh, order of magnitude larger than the uh, mean free path is not it. Okay. So, that is that. So, what we are basically trying to say is that I cannot. Um, so, therefore, this is the Knudsen number which is this right. So, Knudsen number is essentially. So, this has to be uh, less than 10 to the power minus 3. So, therefore, it has to be less than the Knudsen number has to be less than 10 to the power minus 3. Okay. So, in continuum approach. Okay. Uh, so, we just take the Knudsen number to be less than or equal to 1 actually. So, if you see this that is the Knudsen number. So, um, basically the Knudsen number uh, is less than 10 to the minus 3. So, now in continuum approach okay, I can write it here. Do you agree or does it make sense? Think about it the continuum approach right Knudsen number is less than or equal to uh, 1 right. What does that mean? If it was equal to 1 then lambda would be equal to L right that is mean free path is equal to the geometric length right, but it is less than 1. So, lambda is less than L right, which means the geometric length has to be 
at least higher than the mean free path right. So, I mean yeah symmetric length. So, therefore, the Knudsen number is going to be. So, unless and until that is possible then you are not going to be able to use the continuum approach. So, it has to be more than that makes sense that is what we said right. So, if you are making your you know infinitesimal particle or to hold one molecule. So, if, if it can hold more one molecule or two then uh, there is no point right. So, uh, continuum approach in this the length scale at least has to be uh, here L, L uh, lambda by L in it has to be at least greater than the mean free path right. Then you can say uh, you know this is a continuum approach. What do, what do I mean by that? Let me just uh, you know just uh, just say that one more time. So, because what you are saying is here that the Knudsen number is less than 1 which means mean free path by least geometric uh, you know length is less than 1 right which essentially means L. So, the smallest geometric length scale has to be larger than the mean free path makes sense right. So, only then so that is that is how small you can get right. So, when I ask the question or when you should ask the question that you know you have this domain C I have defined in such a way where macro properties can be defined it is a single value right. So, this is the continuum. Now, that single value can be defined on smaller parts of this uh, continuum you know anywhere it will have the same value and a green little box uh, you know uh, particle here infinitesimal element here basically represents the entire domain C. It, 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 it represents that domain right. The question is how small can green or this red or whatever they can be how small they can be. So, the, the, the point is the, the you know the least geometric length scale that you can get to has to be larger than the uh, molecular mean free path right. So, that is how small you can get you cannot have a length scale which is less than that then your continuum concept is not going to work ok. Then it does not work. Okay, so I think um, I'm going to do a little bit, and then sort of, um, yeah, we'll have to stop. Okay, so yeah, so I think I, I've said this earlier. So density is a macro property by summing the weights of. So it's interesting now. When so therefore, one should remember that when I say density, right? Wh what do I mean by density, right? How is density different from molecular mass? there is the molecular mass how is density different because the density is an average value yeah of by summing up the molecular masses of a group of molecules right over a certain volume. So, now in the continuum and then this density is going to be a single value right which is going to be defined on every part of the domain right. So, now our question was how do we define the sizes of this how do we define because the molecules are in random motion and they are constantly moving. So, if I take a certain little box the, you know the number of molecules are also not constant. So, we had to define uh, a certain volume and we found that um, that volume for you know at atmospheric pressure is about 10 to the power 9 right, for all fluids and it contains uh, nearly 3 into 10 to the power 7 molecules all the time. So, then this is sufficient to define a constant you know, density. So, density is a summation of the molecular masses of several a group of molecules right group of molecules over a certain volume and the number of molecules and uh, volume is you know these are the values which are uh, standard values ok. Ok, so I think uh, we should um, you know um, ok, we will stop here and we will take it up uh, next class. See, uh, so the point is now let we, we will have when you are talking about turbulence. So, the turbulence will come only if a fluid moves. So, the important thing is when something is moving 
how do you look at it right right now am i moving well depends you know if you're sitting on mars if you look at me yes i'm moving right but if you're sitting on earth you will see no i'm not moving right uh, when you're sitting inside the airplane you know you're not moving but somebody seeing from outside knows you're moving you know you're going from one place to the other so therefore we need to look at the flow in a certain way again how basically we're talk, talking about reference frames and that is uh, a lagrangian way of looking at it and an eulerian way of looking at it now um, having said that okay uh, in the uh, continuum approach right, that we've talked about so far we've described um, the Knudsen number and we've said that for a continuum approach to be applicable, Knudsen number, which is um, lambda by L, should be less than 1, lambda being the mean free path, okay? um, and L being the uh, smallest length scale. Okay? Now let's see if there is some uh, you know, is, is there somewhere this continuum approach can fail? Or are there places where, you know, um, this, this uh, description of the continuum approach can actually not uh, be applicable? Okay. So in order to do that, um, let me just talk about some of the, some of, uh, the lengths, you know, some of, give you some numbers basically. Okay. So let's do that. So let's say height above sea level and um, the lambda at that place. Okay. So at standard sea level, lambda is about 2.1 into 10 to the power minus 7 feet. That's small enough. As we go higher up, 50,000 feet, it's 1.2 10 to the minus 6 feet, at least 10 times more, right? At 200,000 feet, it's 9.1 10 to the minus 4 feet. So it's, so the mean free path essentially is increasing, you know, quite rapidly at 400,000 feet, it is about 24 feet, interesting, right? So the mean free path at about 400,000 feet is 24 feet, okay? So there's this, there's no way we can use the, uh, you know, the Knudsen number, the way we've written it here, and um, use the continuum approach at 400,000 feet. So at 400,000 feet, this description of the continuum approach is not going to be applicable, right? So that is essentially to say that except for extremely uh, you know, high altitudes, right? Or for flow past very small objects, extremely small objects. So L is basically tending to, you know, a very small number, making it some number very, very large, right? So, then also, uh, if you keep those situations uh, separate, then we can use continuum approach. Then continuum approach is going to be applicable. So, at standard sea level, maybe even 50,000 feet, um, continuum approach is applicable. Um, but other than that, uh, if you sort of uh, go way higher up at higher altitudes, Continuum approach is not going to, it's, it's going to fail or it's not going to hold true the way we've described the continuum approach. Okay. Now, having said that, the Knudsen number uh, is, is still a model, it's still a mathematical model, right, to approximate a group of molecules and um, it depends on Reynolds number and Mach number. And I'm going to use this. Um, paper here, and I'll, I'll give you the reference. Um, this is a 
where we are looking at, you know, some um, the the limits of the continuum approach. Okay, so if you look at say um, figure two, right? So if you look at figure two here, so you have this solid line here, right? And the x-axis is the Reynolds number, and the y-axis is the Mach number, right? And uh, the continuum approach is applicable in the space which is to the right and to the bottom of this a solid line, right? So if you see uh, for um, say Mach number less than 0.1. Right, Mark number less than 0.1, and Reynolds number less than 90. So that's the that's the you know the crossing of the two lines that you can see there, the dotted lines, right? So that's the area. So um, the continuum theory breaks down for boundary layers, right? So that's why we have the boundary layer limit, right? So that's the place. So it, for Reynolds number less than 90 and Mach number less than 0.1, the continuum theory breaks down for boundary layers, okay. as is shown in this uh, plot here. Let's move on to the to another uh, figure here, which is figure 3. Now we have the maximum Knudsen number on the y-axis and the Mach number on the uh, x-axis. And you can see here too, okay, the continuum theory fails for Mach number less than 0.1, okay, and Knudsen number less than 0.008 for boundary layers, okay, that's the boundary layer limit. So that's something we can see from this plot. Again, let us look at, say, um, a figure five here. Okay, so the uh, x-axis is the Reynolds number and the y-axis is the maximum Knudsen number and all these lines are basically at various Mach numbers. Okay, now for example, at a Reynolds number of say 100, okay, Mach number is 10 to the power say minus uh, 5. The maximum Knudsen number is 0 0.001, okay? So in other words, at this Reynolds number, which is 100, and Mach number, which is 10 to the power minus 5, continuum theory is going to be violated if Knudsen number is greater than 0 0.001, okay? That's what we can sort of gather from here okay so now um, Reynolds now for example in the range Reynolds number is greater than 0 0.01 to uh, I mean Reynolds number is greater than 0 0.01 and less than 100 okay and Mach number is so for minus 5 what's the number maximum what's the number is 0 0.001 so hence in this range of Reynolds number and at the corresponding Mach number, continuum theory is going to be violated if its number is greater than 0 0.001. So this is the uh, reference that I've uh, you know used the plots from. So limits of uh, continuum aerodynamics, John F. Aircraft, uh, 2010, um, by W. F. Phillips, Utah State University. Okay, so this is the uh, reference that I've used and you can sort of uh, get it online and uh, look at it. Okay, and if you can't then uh, I can sort of, I, I, I download it from the net, it's possible. So we'll get to that in the next class. So uh, I'll, I'll close today and we'll meet up in the next one. Okay, thank you.